Okay. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Spiro. I am the CEO and co-founder of School Sims, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to um, our panel webinar today. Um, just want to do some quick introductions and then I will hand it over. Uh, Mike, if you could just make to the next slide. I am delighted to welcome um, this distinguished set of panelists. Um, the, really the discussion today is focused on the importance of simulation when it comes to the importance of experience, when it comes to engaging with our um, aspiring administrators as well as our sitting administrators. And I wanted to say real quickly, the focus of today's discussion is going to be primarily around leadership. Um, but for those of you who are, are joining with an interest in simulation more broadly, but also a specific focus on teachers, everything that we're talking about relative to the development of administrators and the preparation for administrators applies to teachers as well. So in terms of one could just replace, uh, search and replace leadership with teachers um, and the same things will apply. So I invite questions and everything else re relative to that discussion. Um, but real quickly, you know, as we know, experience is the best teacher that has been borne out. We all know it, it's certainly the way that uh, we learn from infancy. Uh, it's also the way we have uh, learned mastery over the years through apprenticeships. And now, you know, in other industries, other high stakes industries where we've, we wouldn't put a pilot in a plane without hours in a simulator. We wouldn't put a doctor or nurses into an operating theater or even into a, a patient room without hours in a simulator. We wouldn't send our soldiers out in, from a military perspective without time in simulation or scalable experience, uh, maybe more broadly appropriate. So why do we do that with our educators? Why do we do that with our administrators? It is not easy. The job requires not just knowledge, but more importantly, experience. You're dealing with stakeholders who often have conflicting demands and they're not necessarily rational. So it's not like we can teach you how to deal with that. You have to feel your way through it. And of course, the school of hard knocks is rather painful. And so that's why we wanted to really focus on the importance of experience in, but you have to do it scalably. We have to find a way to do this in a way that can fit in everybody. Nobody's got time. And so we are delighted to have this group of folks together here. Um, in particular, we have Dr. Sheila Moore from University of Central Florida, Dr. Aaron Murray from the University of Connecticut, Dr. Alex Gonzalez from San Diego State, um, Sarah, Dr. Sarah Dexter from UVA, as well as Dr. Ginger Watson, who bring a wealth of experience, both in terms of as practitioners, as researchers, as faculty, um, in and around the concepts of leadership, but also simulation. And in, we'll see, we'll flesh that out um, over the course of the discussion. But lastly, I wanted to introduce uh, Professor Mike Johannick uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. He leads the uh, mid-career doctoral program, as well as many other things. But I wanted to take just a moment to, um, it was with Mike that I began this journey. I've been doing simulations for over 30 years, almost 35 now, uh, but it wasn't in, initially in K-12. But I was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania in a doctoral program offered by the Graduate School of Ed and Wharton for Chief Learning Officers about simulation design and was introduced to Mike. Um, and for those of you who were around at the time, I'm sure that this on this call, we probably have a fair amount of that. They reminded me of the old Reese's Peanut Butter Cup commercial, two great tastes that taste great together. Um, we just uh, hit it off. It was a wonderful discussion. And I talked about Sim, but he shared with me what he called and calls the silent crisis of leadership in K-12, which really was that precipitating moment where it just clicked for me that why apply this approach anywhere else? It is so powerful and the needs are so great. Let's do this here. Now it took a little while <laughs> to, to convince Mike, but we did eventually get there. And ultimately this is what, uh, that was the underpinnings of where School Sims began. Uh, and with that, I wanted to introduce Mike and he will be leading our panel discussion today. Thank you, Ken. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to have uh, to, to be with such a wonderful panel and to have so many people on this call. So thank you for for uh, 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 allowing some time in your afternoon to, to be a part of this discussion. You know, Ken, with that example, I've, I've never been sure whether I was the peanut butter or the chocolate. So we'll have to have that conversation later on <laughs> to figure out how exactly that works out. Um, 
but uh, uh, and perhaps the silent crisis is no longer quite silent for those of you working with school leaders. Um, uh, it, it certainly is something that has only gotten more attention, I think, over the last couple of years. But but essentially, the short story is that I started out as a high school teacher and an administrator, um, and then sort of in a in a not terribly well planned career path, uh, ended up in in doing a lot of professional development, working with teachers and counselors and administrators to to provide both pre service and in service. And over the years found that we could do some really interesting and creative things as I know a lot of you are doing to support people and how they build up their skills, how they kind of orient themselves in terms of certain kinds of dispositions, the knowledge they may need to do it and so forth. And yet, <laughs> there was this elusive piece of the job that seemed so central of when the board meeting or the community meeting goes sideways and how people react, how people get into it, how do they do that? When you have that parent uh, in front of you who is um, presenting, shall we say, a challenging uh, interaction with you and you're trying to figure out how to do that. And the challenge it seemed to us, to, to me was that, as Ken was saying, why would these not be things that we had already uh, practiced uh, and understood and developed the combined capacities around those? Um, conversations with veteran leaders and teachers and, and, and counselors and so forth, always generated a fairly similar set of scenarios <laughs> about the kinds of things one could anticipate facing in the first few years. So that generated this, this interest, I think, among our own students uh, as well at, uh, at Penn and, another, and, uh, and some alumni that got involved in this to figure out how we do this. So with that, I'm just, I'm extremely pleased to, to have our panel here folks who have been involved in this work for a number of years, different lengths of time and in different ways. Uh, I'm gonna ask them to, to uh, kind of briefly introduce themselves and the, the work that they do with this in a couple of minutes. Um, and then we will open up for some discussion around the panel, uh, which I really hope is a conversation there and then open up for discussion for, for all of uh, everybody else on the call. So please be jotting down questions. Uh, I think we have folks monitoring the chat, so feel free to pop them in there as well. Uh, and we will uh, try to make sure we have as robust a, a conversation as possible. Um, so, Dr. Moore, may I turn to you first uh, to, to start us off? Good afternoon. I am thoroughly excited to be a part of my colleagues in this illustrious program with the work that we've done with School Sims. I am also going to be an advocate for school sense because it is a, an instructional tool. I come from a K through 12 background. And once COVID hit and we knew that we would be technology using the online, I'm thinking as an instructor, I need an interactive tool because as adult learning, we need to engage our adults. School Sims answered that. So I use school Sims in my master's program for aspiring principals and in my EDD executive education uh, program. What was so exciting about the work was, as you can see on the screen, the students, when I started using school sims in a synchronous and asynchronous environment, they loved it. They said it was realistic, authentic. It looked at the problems of practice and mostly it's a decision-making tool. So, I'm looking at the, the uh, to using more of school sims in my work with school districts, as well as embedding more of the school simulations uh, within the master's and doctoral program. And as we go through the uh, through the the webinar today, any questions? I'm more than happy to exactly how uh, it works with our aspiring principal program with mentoring and coaching, as well as a uh, problem practice in our ED executive education program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And well within the time frame. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Murray, <laughs> I turn to you, please. Good afternoon. And it is a pleasure and a privilege to be here today um, to be able to share our experience at the University of Connecticut. I have been a longtime K 12 uh, teacher, administrator, assistant superintendent, and a year and a half uh, ago joined as the UCAP. University of Connecticut Administrator Preparation Program uh, coordinator. But I also want to point out, I've been an adjunct professor in this program since 2007. And the evolution of this program, and in the past year to have the opportunity to integrate school sim simulations into our course, our two-year program has just been outstanding. 
the energy, the excitement, the way that we can correlate these simulations with our coursework, core assessments, our intern experiences that, that students have has been outstanding. The reflection, the feedback that we receive from students indicates that their leadership skills are growing, that they're being challenged and being able to think outside the box in situations. And I am always saying that we, we certainly have our coursework and we have our, our internship work, but this is in the middle and it really does provide authentic experiences where students have to really figure out and, and stick to their core values, beliefs, vision, and make quick decisions that are gonna impact stakeholders. So I can't say enough about the work that, that, that we've done at UConn with this, um, this product in a very different manner than what our students have been um, experiencing. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and so we turn to uh, Dr. Ojeda. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. I want to think back to 2018-19 when uh, we were looking at launching a fully online credential, administrative credential program uh, for us here in San Diego State. And at one of the, the, the main things that came up is how are we going to provide some consequential, meaningful tasks for students? And school sims came and delivered. Uh, that's really a product that that was at the foundation of the redevelopment uh, of our program. And we now use it across our traditional face-to-face -face or not so face-to-face -face currently and a fully online asynchronous program. But more so what I think the program has done for our students and for us is to really ground a lot of the learning in relevancy, particularly as we reviewed the simulations with our instructors. Uh, there were a lot of emotions, a lot of uh, flashbacks that would come to the instructor and say, oh, I, I remember this scenario. I've lived through this scenario, uh, or, or, or I know of this scenario. And facilitating that in a synchronous or asynchronous way uh, became a really meaningful way to present the knowledge that we knew existed with our instructors in our program, the lens that we use around equity-driven leadership, and then communicating that to students as they engage in those experiences. And so uh, what I, I really appreciate about the the simulations is that they're not a beginning and an end of an experience, but they're a beginning of a continuum and in, in, in connect, connecting to the relevancy, having these conversations about what took place, what information existed, how do we go about it, and then how that reflects on us as leaders as we go through this. Wonderful, thank you, thank you. And actually those those events are, are a perfect segue to, uh, to, to Dr. Dexter, uh, UVA, if you could join us, please. Hi, I'm Sarah Dexter, <clears throat> and I want to, I think it is a perfect follow through from Alex because as he said, the experience in the sim is an anchor and that's what we have come to characterize our utilization of sims and digital cases. So we actually use three kinds of products, the school sims that um, Ken uh, introduced and got started, as well as uh, Immersion, which is a virtual reality, um, mixed reality, pup digital puppeteering, it's called sometimes, and then eTips cases. And we have selected which kind of product to use at which case with which topics to try and provide a variety of experiences. They are all, they all diff offer different affordances and we've tried to think through what those are and how it matches with, you know, what students need. Um, but in, they share the uh, attribute of serving as the anchor in what we call the um, virtual practicum, right? So practicum is a word more often used in teacher education, but this idea of experience that is um, common it one throughout a class um, and that the instructor can then provide that consistently for people and there's like a less it's less than the internship but it's still very applied so the experiential learning cycle that Kolb um, developed has that you know experiencing at the core then reflecting then thinking then acting so we've been really working with our instructors to get that whole um, pre-case, 
during case, post case, or SIM, if you will, uh, experience going uh, so that the students really maximize their learning. And it provides a wonderful way to give a consistent um, opportunity to learn to our students. And you can see there on the slide some of the kinds of positive things that they um, say about it. And we really peg it to their um, sense of self-efficacy. They're um, able to experience a virtual uh, learning experience as a way to build um, leadership self-efficacy. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, let me uh, uh, invite uh, Dr. Watson to introduce her work as well. And I'm more of the generalist in simulation. It's just so interesting to and, and reaffirming to hear everyone who has uh, spoken before me. Um, I have, like Ken, been working in simulation for over 30 years, and um, I really liked these simulations. I do work with Sarah, and um, when I had a chance to see these, I, I was really um, impressed with many things because I've worked with um, you know, settings where we build simulation and in some cases where it's a really looking at uh, integration. And what's really interesting about these that I've heard from all of the, the speakers before me is that they're immersive. <laughs> these scenarios are immersive. Um, without the expense and such of, of some virtual worlds that don't really capture uh, the type of complexity that are actually captured in these simulations, where there's decision making and role play. They're interactive also in that you, you know, there's turn taking and you get a chance to experience a scenario. I would agree, and you heard this before as well, that uh, they really can evoke emotion, uh, complexity, <laughs> uh, in some cases, not sure. Uh, and that goes beyond what can typically be done in a case um, or, you know, a, a text-based case. Um, then the last thing is that they're also very realistic in that they give the appropriate cues. You get to hear dialogue, you get to receive a call from the press <laughs> and things like this or you know, hear other people in a board meeting that actually stimulate a lot of the complexity of the situation without trying to engage some technologies that just aren't quite ready for prime time yet. Um, and by this, I mean, you know, we see conversational agents and virtual humans and such, and they, they're they just not quite ready for those types of conversations. So the, the interesting piece of this simulation is that it brings all of that together in a very scalable simulation and set of simulations, which you've heard from others, in that they're using multiple simulations across programs. I see it also that it can be used across multiple universities, and as I'm hearing today, across an entire field for training in the field. So this is what simulation does in so many other areas. As I pointed out here, uh, I've worked in most of these, medicine, flight, business, transportation, um, and military, and we couldn't, wouldn't even conceive of uh, having training without simulation. And so um, I think the power of simulation is, uh, it was very powerful and um, that these simulations really fill a, an important niche. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, as, you, as everyone else can see, this is an outstanding panel of, of folks with experience. And I want to just continue some of the conversation in a sense you've already seated here. Um, I should probably, mm -hmm. I think the next slide is me. So it's kind of self, self-serving. Anyway. So I, I, at, at, I'm at Penn, as, as Ken mentioned, I do this doctoral program and a few other things. Uh, we actually use SIMS in our in admissions process uh, and I found it to be a really interesting way to sort of give people a chance to interact and, and understand something about them. Uh, uh, some within the, in the coursework, particularly also within our, our master's level school leadership. Um, and that very last thing at the end there, this judgment project, I hope to, to pick other people's brains on this as we go forward, but it's trying because of the simulations, this underlying kind of capacity that folks have that we're trying to develop to figure out whether or not we can get at that. Because at the end of the day, the thing that I think I, what I hear from leaders has been the frustration of in that moment, uh, how do I deal with this? I mean, there was a survey just out in February of superintendents around the US found that 80% of them find themselves in this moment of, of stress around the politicized environment that they need to manage in those moments. Um, what's underneath that? Can we get at that directly? So. That's that's a bit where I want to uh, start us out, and I want to turn to the panel to just to, to continue really the conversation that you 
each seeded in a couple of your notes, I've been jotting notes as you've been talking in the introduction about what it is that, that we're learning. Uh, and I think some of you have surfaced some of this already about uh, um, ways of eliciting tacit knowledge, different kinds of affordances that different modalities may have, um, both providing shared experiences as well as accelerating experiences, integrations of emotions, all sorts of things that this as a modality can help us deal with. And I'm just wondering if there are some lessons sort of top of mind or headlines um, that you think we're, you're learning from the work that you're doing. Um, and as a heads up toward eventually figuring out what is a field, because I think Ginger, you're absolutely right. This is something that begins to focus a field and not on a theoretical notion, but on that interaction. <laughs> and for those of us who believe deeply in the point of practice as the most intellectually interesting and complex point of focus, uh, that this is sort of the, the modality that says, okay, let's put that front and center. So you all have been doing that, putting it front and center. What are you learning? <laughs> what should we be taking away from this? So one of the things that we're finding um, at UConn is that we've done them in individual settings where, where they do it themselves. But the most powerful place that we have found um, students learning and deepening their learning is through collaboration with other UCAP leaders. And the feedback that we, we, we get from, um, from them once they're, when they're done, and I, I tell this story a lot when I did it with, with my class and had six in a group and they were standing up and, and leaning over the desks and listening to each other and, and really listening to different perspectives on how to make these quick decisions in settings that, and they're like, wow, I can't believe something like this really comes up, but they really do come up. So having that opportunity to collaborate and to listen to other perspectives when making decisions like this is just a valuable opportunity to build their knowledge and skills as they transition from that mindset of teacher mindset to leader mindset. Wonderful, wonderful others. I'll um, speak up. I think that our exploration of these as tools um, echoes Aaron's remarks that they are flexible. You can use them in lots of different ways to evoke something. But the thing that I overall want to emphasize is that we're learning it's not about the tool, right? It's about what you're trying to elicit from students. And so them doing a, a simulation is great. And you want to be clear, like, what am I trying to find out about what the students know, or what am I trying to find out about what they can do and how to give them um, best feedback on that. Because this is, you know, they're in our programs as a growth experience. And I don't see simulations as a way to teach content, but rather apply it. And then in applying it, unpacking, like what are some of the, the sub skills and how can we capture that and tell them about it? And um, sort of formally give them some kind of framework for thinking about it. I mentioned earlier that we are using um, self-efficacy as one lens of something that could be measured, captured. And we asked the students at the beginning and the end of each course, to self-assess on a, leader, a set of leadership decision-making uh, steps. And there's a, it's 12 things in all, I'll just say simply. And then at the end of the course, do the same thing. Now, of course, we hope that they're getting something from the content of the course. It's not just the simulations that is causing this increase. And we don't have enough sections to set up a nice randomized control experiment, which would be great. But, um, but they do say things about how um, emotional arousal, source of efficacy, um, self-efficacy, how that um, is allowed for in their experience, their master experience, their vicarious experiences, and their imaginal experiences. And so I think um, helping to anchor for them, what's a way to think about your growth as a result of this experience, but then um, for us to know as instructors um, so that we can uh, help contribute, you know, to the kind of feedback, to the directional steering that we provide students so that they gain the most that they can and help them then bring into their own lens 
okay, how should I be thinking about this? You know, what and recognize like I do have an experience that is like the one that just happened. Um, and that's one other thing I'll just add to that train of thought is that the three different kinds of tools that we use each elicit a different level of response and we think require a different level of preparedness. And I'll say that in our mind, theoretically, we thought that immersion where they had to just talk off the top of their head and react to a human would be the hardest one. The students said, no, then I could just talk. <laughs> They thought that the school sim ones were harder because they had to pick among choices and maybe those weren't any of the choices they would have put forward or they had to agree with somebody about the choice. So, you know, uh, our theoretical model was a little bit undermined in that respect. <laughs> um, I think that my main point is to figure out how to capture what's specific learning and articulate it so that students see their growth, we understand the role of these tools best in our programs. I want to jump in on what um, so far how school sims with my program. Uh, basically, I, I'm fortunate. This is our first time moving into the school sims. I think I'm the baby of the panel when it comes to implementing uh, school sims. So this and it's implemented in two of the courses, a master's course and a doctoral course, because I wanted to see with the very simulations, what was more applicable for aspiring principals and in my EDD executive program, they are sitting principals, they're current administrators, practicing administrators. But what was most uh, fortunate for me right now is the feedback. As I look at eliciting the feedback that keeps me current, and to inform the faculty and looking at more at the curriculum, looking at our standards and how the simulations actually bring to life those standards. And with the various types of simulations, for example, off the top of my head about um, observation, observing the novice teacher, which I use in my supervisory practice class. That did more for them to see that observation than me say, going in and actually looking at them, trying to give them practice in the classroom. That simulation helped with the practice piece. Then I'm able to elicit the feedback as they look at, as I said in the slide before about the comments on, um, I never th thought about that before. And I did see a question about the emerging roles. Well, I try to make sure that in when I do the Sims in my class, that I have them in groups. And since the Sims can be played over, I have them take on the different roles so that they can get the perspective of not just the principal, but whether it's a parent or a teacher or community member. Uh, that's how um, I use the Sims in, in, in that aspect. So, Keep me in mind as I go forth to convince my faculty that this would be a, a vital part <laughs> of our program because we look for job and we keep saying this word job embedded. Okay, authentic. Well, our simulations help us to define what is authentic and what is job embedded. Wonderful, thank you. I'm convinced. <laughs> so. So, Alex, I saw you trying to, to unmute there for a second. I'm not sure if you were trying to jump in. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I want to echo. I think we're what we're talking about here is the anchor uh, across, you know, the relevancy of where we place these simulations and how we utilize the simulations. Essentially, uh, I can give you an example. For example, in our program, we have five types of equity-driven leadership that we that we use to to ground the work uh, in the courses. Not all of them are applied across all the courses, but there are courses that emphasize data-driven decisions, learnership, systems thinking, operational, uh, culture and climate. And so we have courses that are specifically designed around enhancing these knowledge and skills. So then we pair the, the simulations as relevant as they are uh, to those courses. And we place the, the simulations in the lesson or in the unit where that content or that topic is being discussed. And when we use what we call application to practice, so after the knowledge is, has been developed, after the students have had some time to, to kind of um, uh, you know, process that, they have to then do something. And, and part of that activity is doing a simulation. 
not only doing the simulation, which is wonderful, don't get me wrong, there's, there's fantastic feedback, there's opportunities to pause, come back to it, uh, start over, uh, you know, make your decisions as, as you go along. But we added a, a rubric based reflection uh, component in which the students have to reflect not only on the logistical things, you know, what happened, who was present, uh, what are some of the uh, data elements that were a part of the simulation and experience, but more so in terms of how they are reflecting on how they apply the type of leadership thinking that is emphasized in the course. So, for example, on the school turnaround, for example, you know, how did data thinking or data design thinking impact your decision making as you have that lens? Uh, or perhaps what are the other uh, two or three that are emphasized in the course that perhaps would have aided you in thinking about addressing the issue at hand and going through the, 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 the workflow of collecting information and, and addressing the issues or engaging with the stakeholders. And what we have found is that the students find that connection, that relevancy really important because they're able to then reflect not only on what they've learned, but where they currently have positioned themselves as a leader. Uh, and so we have found that that is a, a valuable uh, exercise beyond the exercise as they reflect on their own experiences and the decisions that they went through the opportunities that they had to then connect with what decisions they made and what they could potentially change or learn from for next time. Uh, and so we've kind of grounded our work around that. And uh, as an instructor, it's great to be able to see that. And it also, you know, raises some flags in some cases like, oh, I think we need to talk a little bit more about uh, the data protocol, or we need to talk a little bit more about how to involve the stakeholders and the feedback portion of it. So for us, it's, it's not only great, you're able to reflect on this and you tell me what happened, but more so, how are you processing this critically? Fantastic, fantastic. There were some questions too here about in, in the chat. I'm trying to capture some of them. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I may miss some of them, but I'm going to try to do my best along the way uh, about sort of some of the others on format in terms of, uh, um, well, part of it having to do with the repetition as people may want to repeat sims and what are you learning from that? Question also about synchronous and asynchronous uh, as to how you use the simulations. And I'm wondering if, if anybody wants to comment on those. I use them both ways. I use them and I saw someone else in the chat. I kind of use it the same way as a homework assignment. And then I use it as, as we say in K-12, a bell, a bell ringer or a discussion point to start, particularly if it's on uh, that topic for my topic of discussion for that day, I use them in that way. So, and also use them as a, a collaborative group project as well. To involve environment synchronous because my class I'm teaching an online and mixed mode um, environment. So, gotcha, gotcha. and I, I would echo exactly. We've done it in, in a very similar way. But one of the things that I think has been uh, different for us is that our year two students, because they, they didn't have the exposure in year one, they asked specifically if there was an opportunity that they could have more opportunities to engage in simulations. And so I was able to put together six that had not been used in their classes and uh, gave that to them in January so that they could utilize them with their colleagues. They could utilize them with, um, you know, people that they're working with, et cetera, um, to, to really um, get a, a different kind of experience. So putting out supplemental opportunities to utilize the simulations I'm very eager to engage in, in conversation with them. Some I've, I've spoken to and have found it extremely beneficial to have that opportunity to collaborate with others. I'll add that we have used, we teach our classes synchronously online, but we have had students both use them in class occasionally, although usually as homework. I mentioned this in the chat. And even if the students are doing it individually, um, or with a partner, we have them do it as homework. So arrange a time to, you know, share screen, go through this together. And you have to come to consensus on an answer. And uh, if you heard David Jong, who's in this uh, audience talk, he has had some, um, we got that idea from him, actually. Uh, and also, um, one thing that another one of our instructors at EVA did was uh, during the pandemic and the shortage of internship hours, you know, at the very beginning where students weren't able to go into schools and it was all getting sorted out. How are we doing schooling? Um, 
they had the opportunity to do a sim with one of their administrative team members as an internship hour experience. And um, that was a great experience for them. I know someone else mentioned in our preparatory time that they use that kind of approach at their institution. And then lastly, I'm gonna invite um, a colleague of mine, I won't call her out by name, but she's on the call right now. And maybe she'll share something about their uses in our classes because um, she's taught our courses several times that use those. So thank you. Should we provide an awkward pause here to see whether or not she clicks off her microphone, Sarah? Is it? Is, Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. <laughs> all right. I'm taking advantage of uh, uh, the format so I can get my walk in. So excuse me as I breathe a little hard while I speak. Hi, <laughs> I'm Tinkani White. I hope you are talking about me, Dr. Dexter. Um, yes, we have used the Sims in our uh, Leadership for EdTech class. And we've used both uh, the Sims as well as the Merging. In the feedback, um, I really what I found interesting was the emotion that elicited um, in students, and it's very typical to the emotion <laughs> that you would find, you know, the, the emotion that you would have when you are actually dealing with the issues um, in real life, so to speak. So we found it to be very, very useful. Fantastic, thank you. And I agree with Alex. I do like the bird singing. Uh, <laughs> sitting in Manhattan, we don't we don't get a lot of bird singing going on necessarily. But I could share with you a siren or two just to give you that appetite with that ambiance. Um, I'd I'd like to sort of too to get back to this question about what your uh, I, 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 this focus on the what are we trying to develop? What are you trying to learn? But also, what are our students trying to learn? And that somewhat goes to this question of when people come in. I've, I've certainly often found that to be the case where participants in a sim, one of the first requests is, can I do that again? <laughs> can I try that again? And it is, I mean, one can understand that just from a visceral experience. I think I could do this, I'll try this out and so forth. Um, but it's also evident that somebody's trying to find something else out. They're trying to determine something from it as well. And almost to your question, uh, or to your note, Sarah, about whether or not it teaches content. What I think is interesting is the role it plays in stimulating a demand or desire for content rather than necessarily delivery for content. And I wonder how that's playing out for folks. Um, and, and so what are you trying to um, uh, uh, elicit? What do you see students trying to elicit from this modality, again, in the different forms that may exist? Um, and how do you know this, this stuff is working? <laughs> how do you know if it's in addition to them having good experiences, perhaps, and saying that this is this is nice and interactive, what is it that we're developing out? You can see my bias in terms of the judgment project stuff I've been working on, but what is it that that you think you're, is developing out? How do we know this is, is having an impact? I want them to feel it. I mean, we talk a lot about emotion, but it's not until you're in that hot seat. And I think that that's, you know, kind of at the centers, we, we want to provide them, like we've said, we didn't have some opportunities during distance learning, we're getting back to that now. But uh, I think what we've learned is that, you know, even in the real setting, you know, you go do an observation, you go do some shadow walks, you might or might not see some of these issues, right? And what we want our students to know is that this, these things can happen, and they have happened, as Ken, I'm sure, will tell you, is that these all come from real scenarios. Uh, you know, dealing with a difficult teacher, dealing with dress code, dealing with a coach, dealing with a parent, dealing with the superintendent. And so uh, for me, I, I think part of it is, is that they feel those emotions and that they harness them and that through through our program and and through leadership dispositions that they're able to engage with them uh, in a practical in a practical way and that they're able to kind of you know deconstruct and then themselves decompress because it is an emotional uh, experience either in a simulation or in real life uh, I think get, getting back to the the previous notion around synchronous or asynchronous uh, nothing's going to beat the the emotions that come up when they're in a class because we do facilitate them in person uh and when they go did you did you select that did you see in the or the gasp or the ah you know because you're not going to get all the choices right the simulations are or they have a formula to them and in a sense that structure to to measure uh around the metrics that are in place and so some of those decisions are like well i want to make a different decision well this is what you have you know this is this is a scenario where you might find yourself whether because it's something is of, of a, a time constraint or a resource or anything else that these are the decisions that you have to make. Now, what is going to be your choice? 
And so for, for us, it's really around giving them that opportunity to step into those shoes, to sit in that principal desk, to walk those halls and to have those interactions with individuals where they're going to have to feel it. They're going to have to get a sense of what that tingling feeling is or what that burning sensation is uh, as they have to make those decisions. And, and Ginger, if I could put you on the spot for a moment, I was going to ask you about, um, because he, this, this sort of emotional trial run going through it, uh, my quick read, and I find myself as I was swimming in other people's pools of, of research literature that are not my own <laughs> uh, to try to understand, but it seems that this also actually has had some effectiveness in reducing stress uh, within those professional roles that people have had uh, a chance to work through that a bit and, and God knows if we can do something that helps people with stress, that would seem like a promising thing to pursue. But I would turn to your uh, expertise. Absolutely. Um, it's been shown in a number of other professional areas that um, by encountering some of the very difficult or complex situations multiple times, uh, one is just much more prepared. You develop a competency, but you also develop that, you know, maintaining your emotion sometimes in that time of stress. You've had a chance to work through it. Um, you know, we say the reason Sully Sullenberger landed the plane <laughs> in the Hudson is because there was an opportunity to practice that and practice it, you know, every few months, essentially. But um, it's really the complexity and the practice, and especially for these um, you know, uh, individuals who are new to the profession, uh, it's really critical because they're dealing with a lot of complexity maybe for the first time, as well as um, looking at the multitude of responses. Everything that people have said is uh, wonderful. How many times do they go through it? What happens when there's kind of a mistake or it doesn't end well? Uh, how we learn much more sometimes from our mistakes than we do getting something right the first time, uh, because there's a lot of understanding the nuances involved. Um, and so the emotion, repetition, <laughs> and then application has been shown to transfer very positively to real world applications in a variety of disciplines. Yes. I see a hand raised, actually. But Yeah. Hi. My name is Tom. I'm sorry. I, I joined you a little bit late. Uh, I was in traffic. But I wanted just to say that um, I find it's a really great tool uh, to use for reflection. Uh, my my uh, program is at Turo University, along with Alan Sebel. And uh, most of our um, students are New York City um, teachers who are aspiring administrators. And uh, the way I recently used uh, one of the simulations uh, was uh, as a, um, uh, we're, we're an asynchronous program and uh, we use it as a project so that the students were placed into groups and they had to encounter the problem and there were six different opportunities within this particular um, simulation to make decisions. So for each one, they had to make a presentation, each group had to make a presentation in which they uh, explained their thinking as to why they chose a particular option in each case. And then also they, they uh, simultaneously explained why they didn't choose the other options. And it was very, very interesting. And I got some very good feedback from the students about it. So I, I think that we, we, don't, we don't reflect enough on, on certain things and uh, you can only reflect so much on reading. But when you put them in a situation like that, that was uh, and in this particular situation, it could have happened almost in any school. Um, I think that's really valuable. So thank you. Oh, thank you. And, and I noticed there was a comment earlier about the reflection piece uh, as well. Uh, and, and I just sort of want to get an understanding of how people are using that. And, and what do you look for in people's reflections? Um, you know, is it given the peculiarity of this as a tool? What is it that that you and I'll start with the panelists, but then open it up to others. What are you learning? What are you looking for in that reflection that you think this particular modality helps you understand or elicit? Well, I'll, I'll throw in that I think the most important way that these can serve as excellent reflection points is because the instructor knows what the experience was. If you ask them to do reflection logs in their internship experience, which is a great activity, 
but they're all out at 30 different schools and you don't know what they experienced. You don't know, did they catch something? Did they miss something? Did they interpret something well or not? And as a middle section between you know, text and then working with text and then going out into the field, this middle ground that simulations helps you address where you can give them this concrete similar experience. And then to see, you know, were they thinking of their actions? Were they looking inwardly? And I wanna just say that, um, this is a little digression from your question, Mike, but I think it um, brings up a larger point that we can um, al allow for SIMS to provide a way for students to see back something about themselves. They are able to, it's kind of fail safe, it goes slow enough. They can have to record what they decided. There's that little artifact that can be given to them by school systems at the end. All of that serves as a point upon which students can reflect. And so then if they see themselves as the bringer of bias, of assumptions, of prior experience or lacking prior experience, if they start to see their role in the way that they made choices, I think that's a critical aspect to look for in their reflection. And it's also congruent with them developing along that model of um, adult development called the constructive developmental theory. The idea that you recognize you yourself are authoring your own um, viewpoints and, you know, to, well, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. I think I could I could build upon that um, with um, the students responding to, to build their own understanding of, of themselves and their leadership skills and to, to deeply understand their core values, their vision, how decisions are made and how they impact the students, the families, the community members. It's really the aha that comes from these experiences. That, that says, I wouldn't have thought about that if I hadn't been involved in this simulation. It really made me think more deeply of who I am. And the other piece that I find so powerful when I talk to them is that they, they can talk about how these experiences are building their theory of action as a leader as they move forward. And very, very powerful. I, in my reflections, and I do have them do reflections. I look at it from the various perspectives collectively as I look at they all. It gives me an insight into the students that I'm dealing with, looking at the insight into their own personal worth, uh, their reflections about what they're with children, community, teachers. So it gives me a wealth of information as I plan my, my teaching, the, the topics, as they give me insight to how, what's going on with them and how this SIMS apply to them in their schools. Is it, is it current? And do they give a, a, a current or say, well, you know, I, I've had this before. This is what I did in a similar situation. And to add on, I like when they come, they've come back to me and say, you know what, Dr. Moore, I just had a similar situation. And doing this SIM, and really, I had a student said, doing that sim helped me when I recognized the situation, I was able to apply something different than what I would have. So that was all I needed to hear is that it's working. You know, we, we utilized uh, 20 plus, 24, 29 uh, simulations across our, our, our courses, uh, and they're doubled up in some courses, they use one and another one. Uh, and because it's across our entire program sequence, what we see early on is that an outcome is that they're surprised, right? They're, they're surprised about what they experienced uh, and they're, they're kind of caught up initially uh, around making the right decision. Like I want to make the right decision. I want to be perfect. And that's not what it's about. It's not real about that. It's, it's about getting that experience. It's about applying what they know and then reflecting on that. And what we see later on as they progress through the course sequence is that the reflections change. As I mentioned earlier, we have uh, a, a, a reflection rubric that we utilize as a part of a separate assignment that follows the simulations. What we end up seeing is that they end up thinking again more critically, but more critically about their growth, 
the decisions that they have made because they have learned from before and they're not so caught up on just making clicking the right thing but more so about the process about who they talk to about uh, did they answer that phone call or not about whether or not they decided to take action right away or or wait or collect more evidence so it's really interesting to see that growth in the in the candidates because then they themselves they're, they're able to then develop not only the knowledge but then sort of that protocol that patience that ability to think about what they're going to do next uh, rather than just acting in the moment and i think that that's been a, a an aha for them and also for us to, as, as the instructors to be able to notice some of that growth across in the program. I think I, I was just at that last point about the, I mean, that pause in the moment uh, is something that we hear a lot from folks uh, and uh, to the good and the bad. Sometimes they figure they, they hear people that, you know, they, they, they make a, they reframe a bit in the moment and some of their colleagues are wondering why they didn't just, but it's a, it's a, it's a powerful piece. And I think, and this to, to sort of to the larger question of the field, uh, you know, it seems to me these these give us a and for individuals as well as for the field, they give us an empirical view into how we are actually doing some decision making. <laughs> um, so I can actually see that I tend to have these patterns in my decisions, perhaps, and it's a point of reflection then. Um, and it's not somebody else telling me, but it's something that I've generated uh, by way of information for myself and for our own. We're doing some work outside the U.S. as well in simulations. I was talking to somebody who heads up. Uh, uh, education in Nuevo León in Mexico, Sofia Let Leticia Morales, who's a phenomenal leader. Um, and she was saying that one of the things that they're trying to do is to increase more autonomy at the school level for principals in that state. Um, and the challenge was they had very little view into what their level of autonomy or view around it or self-efficacy is there to your question. It was at the moment. <laughs> Where was their baseline? Where were they even starting? And something that would provide a view into that, both for the individuals uh, as well as for, for others. Um, let me make sure, Ken, I'm not sure how we're, if we have a little bit of wiggle to, to just open up further for questions. I know there's some great questions in the chat still. Um, Sorry. Yes, absolutely. If you could actually, if I'm going to jump on here for just one minute, that's great. And I hate to interrupt. And I will tell everybody that we're going to continue past the hour for anybody who can stay, but we realize that, uh, and it will be recorded and we will share the recording. So if you need to jump, um, by all means. But I did want to share an offer. Um, so before we go, if you just switch over to the slides for one second, uh, and let you know that first of all, as was mentioned, you know the simulation, the library is there's 35 titles in the library. Um, the next slide, please. And just so you know, you can see more about this at schoolsims.com. So if you want to see both on the um, how the sims are, what the library is, how they're aligned to the PSEL standards or the teacher sims which are also aligned mm -hmm. to standards. Um, you can certainly see more at the website if you go to the next slide. We did wanna make an offer uh, just for everybody who's attending here. We're actually excited to be able to offer um, an invitation to our virtual snack and learn professional development, which we do for you in the district mm -hmm. or in a higher ed institution. We take care of everything. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll provide you um, access to the opportunity to engage with uh, members of your audience in a SIM. Um, and uh, have an opportunity for a small snack, but in the opportunity to really engage, to really right, learn, seeing is one thing, doing is believing. It is all about learning by doing. And so the opportunity to engage with you um, is an opportunity that we'd like to offer to you. And so please, um, you can use the QR code or reach out um, in the email that you'll be receiving post webinar. And we'd love to hear from you and also love to engage with you. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, Mike, and we can hopefully continue the discussion. But thank you all for uh, participating. And again, we greatly appreciate uh, your time. And please feel free to submit your questions via chat. There was one question I wanted to make sure got answered by Patricia um, in terms of where the Sims come from. All of the Sims, as, as Alex mentioned, um, are actually de developed in collaboration with practitioners. We don't have um, an ivory tower filled with folks who are just writing you know, scenarios, we actually collaborate with people in the field. So every sim is inspired by somebody's real experiences. So we don't want to recreate history, but we do want to keep them authentic. And so whenever a new topic needs to come up, whenever a new issue, new problem of practice needs to be attended to, it actually comes from the field. And that's how we respond. And that's how the library continues to grow. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mike. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And that snack and learn thing, is that is the snack provided too? I just wondered about that, whether or not 
wasn't sure. Okay, just okay. <laughs> the learn part, though, is you're snacking on the cognitive food. I got it. I got it. So I wanted to turn. We want to hit all the things in the experience. We want to hit emotional. Right. You know, it's the emotional engagement, Holistic. as was mentioned, and some people respond well to the food. So it's whatever it takes. The snack is provided. That's right. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so, so let me just return to to uh, any other remaining questions from the the uh, um, uh, from participants here, and from the panel, from those who are attending. Um, and I also would like to plant the question to all of us: what What seems to be the next thing we ought to be doing? <laughs> Where do we take this? What is the What is the both for individual programs, I suppose, but even more so toward toward the field. Um, what is it that we as a field, it seems, I mean, we, we heard early on about how other fields have been doing these kinds of simulations, and it's certainly something that I find myself learning a great deal from, from nursing, from medicine, from there's other kinds of fields that have these and are looking at the, the development of their professionals intentionally around uh, uh, the information that can be thrown off from different modalities of simulation. So I'm wondering whether, what people's thinking is based on your own experiences, what we ought to be doing next. Uh, uh, in the area of um, simulations and this kind of experiential learning. I think more research is needed to establish the efficacy of these, to set up the empirical uh, design, the research design that would allow us to understand the impact that they make. Um, Ginger just made that point in the chat. And uh, she offered to, I'm going to take her up on that offer to <laughs> look at some experimental designs. But, you know, many of us are at institutions where the program size would make it difficult to do um, an, a randomized assignment. Um, if you have two or more sections running at, at your institution of the same course, hit me up. I would like to collaborate with you um, because you need to be able to, uh, Alex, you do. <laughs> um, you need that in order to kind of set up the research designs that help us really establish what, what kind of learning tool are these? How, what do, to what outcomes do they contribute, et cetera? Great. Yeah, Mike, I think, I think uh, Sarah's onto something in you too. I think we need to write about the leadership pause. I think that's our title. I think that's, that's what we need to write about. I like that. Hit the pause button. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I do think also that, you know, building the, the learning, the adult learning um, of the instructors and our instructional coaches and um, all of the people, the mentors, to, to really bring our mentor principles into the fold of, of understanding these opportunities um, to, to have to grow. And I, you know, in my previous experience in a K-12 system, if I had this as the assistant superintendent, I'd be doing this monthly with my, my mm -hmm. principals to continue to build and skill, but to build and, and, and engage in that adult learning um, is really such a powerful tool for these simulations. And I want to jump in and say principal supervisors. We really, the principal supervisors, we need, uh, because they're the ones that actually are the mentors for the principals. So if we had that piece in, I'm like you, the bulk of my career was in central office, we call it central office. And if they had this type of tool at the monthly meetings for professional development, I believe, and then the tool to pass down piggyback, I think we will have a much more well-rounded decision-making. We will be able to see uh, more effective decision-making. Mm -hmm. that's, that's echoed in the chat by, uh, by uh, 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 urging towards some sy more systems level work. Um, also seeing a, an urging for uh, more toward equity topics uh, and also special education. Um, I see an electronic hand raised, although I'm trying to scramble around the screens to see which one got raised. Um, if you just raise your hand, could you run his own? Ah, James McCarter? Yes, Dr. James McCarter, uh, Director of Student Services for Camden County Schools in Georgia. And I, I just want to attest to the fact I have several uh, teachers, administrators that I've mentored throughout the years, and I've had the opportunity to use these simulations with them. And now many of them are serving as principals and administrators uh, within different districts. And I've had quite a few come back and ask uh, about the simulations 
uh, as well as to reference the, uh, the effect that it had on them and, and building them themselves as leaders. So I, I just wanna say thank you uh, to you and your team. And you asked, what could you do next? Just keep marching forth and getting the word out in, in reference to this uh, form of professional development. I think it's absolutely amazing and I believe it's the future. So thank you guys. Great, thank you, thank you, great. Other thoughts, questions that you may have? I just wanna point out one thing because I have to follow up. That always just warms my heart to hear this. Having done work in this area for so long, the experiential element does make it very memorable. It is something students may not remember, you know, something that they read, but they will always remember those things that they did. Um, and I think that's where there's also a very, very unique fit for this type of tool, you know, simulated tool within a curriculum. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. And, and I think it's something echoing, Andrea, I see in the chat, uh, echoing Sheila's point in the sense of going after, you know, working to develop the capacity of professor practitioners uh, in their use of these kinds of modalities as well. Um, since there can be, the academy can be all consuming in its, its methodologies that it has a certain inertia around. <laughs> uh, I will to, offer you know, that I have a paper um, under review with um, JEA um, that should hopefully get published soon. <laughs> and um, it describes how often simulations and role plays and cases, digital cases and paper cases are used in preparation programs. I'll just give you like the punchline. It's not a lot. And, you know, cases, of course, paper cases more so in role plays a fair amount, but uh, not necessarily digital ones like, like immersion, for example. But overall, this uh, pedagogy, this tool and pedagogy is used, I think, far too infrequently for what it can offer. And so talking about um, not just like, oh, students really enjoyed it, that's important, and it's memorable to them, that's important, but like all the ways that we can articulate the value of these for student learning, and that's where I think it's so important to do the research. Wonderful, wonderful. Other questions or thoughts? I, I do have to throw in, because I mentioned this before, I, I do think this is something that is a field-wide opportunity. Um, and and uh, Sarah, you're right, you've been a champion on this on this modality for a long time, and, and I think also been very useful. I've been, I have borrowed, uh, with citation, I should always say, borrowed heavily the, the continuum that, that you all generated a few years ago and such, and it's just a way for us to orient our thinking about it, um, since we tend to skew toward a certain kind of way of, of preparing people. Um, so it does open that up. Um, and I think it's also an opportunity for us to do, we're about to begin some, some work on doing some cross-national study of uh, principal development, um, using the same SIM <laughs> underneath it and sort of adapting it to four different countries. Um, and uh, so I just got that email earlier today. So I'm on a little bit of that high before I figured out that I actually have to do all that work and figure out how to do it. Um, but it's, a, it's an opportunity to say, is this actually, can we look at the profession globally around some of these scenarios that we all face, which are in different contexts and systems. But boy, the, that parent coming after you in the morning is similar across a lot of cultural boundaries. Um, and how do we as a profession learn more globally just the way others do? Judge, I see you jumping in on that one. And then you've got, you know, I don't want to get into certification and things like that, but that you can learn also from many other professions of how these standardized scenarios have actually really helped the professions at large. So I'll just add that it exists in flight, it exists in healthcare and a variety of, of the professions within the healthcare setting. It's time for education. <laughs> it's time for education to step into this. It is, it is. Um, and thank you, I have to acknowledge my colleague, wonderful colleague here, uh, practice uh, professor uh, Andrea Kane on there. And thank you for that note, um, uh, who is uh, also bringing uh, a phenomenal experience from superintendency work into our, into our efforts. Anyway, um, so- Can I just say, teacher education please. is quite far ahead of leadership education. So and some I, of you I, on yes, this call, yes. I think, are from, from teacher ed, but 
they are embracing the utilization of sims of a variety of types of simulations. Um, they're several years ahead, I'd say. So, yeah, yeah. No, Why is that? True. You know, teachers always takes takes a while for administrators to catch up to teachers. That's usually that's been the, as a historian, I'll say that might be the case. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> anyway, I do want to do want to. Uh, yes, time. That's true. That's true. Um, any other questions? So I don't want to cut us short, but I also want to be respectful of time and really appreciative of the of the engagement that people have had. I know we're recording all this, uh, and so there'll be a chance to come back to it. Just like with simulations, you can replay it and, and see how it went. Um, see that tuck that one in there right at the end. Just any other questions, thoughts, comments? Can anything that we need to wrap with or anything? Well, uh, thank you very much, Mike. And thank you to all the panelists. Um, we greatly appreciate for us, it's it's a learning opportunity. And um, the, the beauty of, of the, op, the, the way things are being deployed, the diversity of, you know, from my, from my standpoint, it is simulation is a gift that keeps on giving because it really does put the power of learning, as was mentioned, back in the hands of the students. It's really not about the sim, it's not about the tool, it's about what a student does with it. And it allows for whether it's applying uh, concepts, whether it's discovering what you don't know, and then you wanna go, it's all part of the experience, right? So as far as the student's concerned, it just makes everything more memorable because you're more engaged. Um, and you know, uh, this is maybe the next the, the topic for one of the next webinars will be about neuroscience and what is happening with this and why does this work? It, it's chemical, we can't help it. So the question is not how great the sims are, which we'd like to think that they are, but it really is how we as humans engage and it's chemical. And so the opportunity to allow for this to happen and to model it, right? I mean, one thing that 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 we're also exploring is Doing simulations is powerful, but sometimes leading a simulation. I think Alex mentioned this relative or on the faculty um, experience with engaging with the sims, but you can assign this to students or to participants in a district to run a sim with their team. And they get to practice facilitative leadership. One of, I'm not sure if he's on, Daniel Ray from Rockdale, but they do that as part of their aspiring leader program where they have APs actually lead a sim and then do it with a principal so that they can get feedback. And so because it does allow you to practice facilitative leadership. And so the doing, the leading of a sim, if you will, is just a whole nother thing or a teacher leader doing it in a PLC. But it's a modality that allows for, as you can see, each of the programs does them differently. And each of them are wonderful approaches and a great impact as, uh, as part of the objectives that each program has for their students. And just if it wasn't clear already, obviously the same work can be done in district, uh, although our panelists are all currently um, ensconced in the academy. Um, the ability to do these actually in district by you know, professional development or as part of, of ongoing work in the district is obviously also um, doable and relevant and all these experiences can be had uh, directly in districts. But it is wonderful to hear um, how you perceive it, each of you being the panelists and those who have shared, because we learn from that. And this is something that, that does continue to evolve. And it is something that, again, allows us to keep focusing on the issues of the moment, because these are what the people struggle with. And there was a quote in, was it you, Mike, who put it in there? No, somebody put in a quote, you know, that often we dealing with a crisis is when we're in crisis. That's the wrong time. Right. If you're in crisis, forget it. You're, it's too late. Um, uh, you know, your your amygdala has been hijacked, and you're in fight flight mode. And there's no, you know, thinking is not going to happen in that moment. Um, and so, the opportunity to practice beforehand, the opportunity to hear, to be part of a group that we're not alone, um, can help both with making us prepared, but also our well-being. Yeah. Just one and one extension. I always get the warm and fuzzy when you say it's all chemical, uh, Ken. But um, <laughs> but but the uh, the one thing that uh, an extension of the use that I thought was very useful it sort of came to mind on the uh, can you rotate roles kind of thing was early on when we started doing this work. One of the early sims that, that Ken and I worked on together had to do with a, a, a superintendent's first days in office, and one of the suggestions from the superintendents who helped us at that was you should make this publicly available so that my community has to take it <laughs> because then they might bring a different understanding to the work that I'm facing and I'm doing 
And so there's another kind of use for this that might just be toward now. I've met, what would it be like if I walked into a, a public board meeting and these folks had actually worked through a simulation of my role as a superintendent? <laughs> anyway, another direction for us to potentially <laughs> pursue as well. But um, with well, that, I parents, think I was right. We can do that, and, and we can do with parents as well, right? In terms right. of you know that right. that have those shared experiences where that the collaboration can happen cross doesn't have to be in the building or in the district it can actually span into other um stakeholders and, and empathy building and and just get get insight yeah yeah anyway and thank you all very much oh sorry. no just i just wanted to say ken one of the things i think about is we're preparing these aspiring administrators that will be the next generation of school leaders how this will continue to expand and reach the entire field, which is, is pretty exciting. So I, I wonder what that will look like in three years and five years and 10 years down the road. Yeah. Well, I hope we're still able to, I mean, I hope we continue to have these conversations. That's why I'm, I'm very grateful to Ken and others for kind of putting together this whole thing and getting us together because uh, I think there's a lot of practice and a lot of that we can learn only by putting ourselves together in fairly real time as we try to develop this for the field. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, if anybody has further questions, please feel free to reach out to us, schoolsims.com. Uh, there's opportunities to click for more information and or reach out case bureau at schoolsims.com. Happy to hear from you and look forward to being in touch. Thank you all.